Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here today. My name is Bianca Wicca Martin, and I'm the curatorial assistant for uh, the exhibition Faith and Fortune. And I'll be moderating this talk between Adam and Nina. So the Art Gallery of Ontario operates on land that is Michisaugig Nishnabe territory. Toronto is governed by Treaty 13 between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government. It has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat confederacies. Since 1701, Toronto has been governed by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. As the child of immigrants from Indonesia and the Philippines, I too am complicit in settler colonialism in this country, and I'm hopeful that engaging in conversations like the one we're about to have will broaden under our understanding of the effects of colonization and transcultural exchange. Uh, so just some housekeeping details about today's event. Uh, we're recording this conversation and it'll be available afterwards on ago.ca. Uh, closed captions are available and there'll be time for questions at the end of the talk. So please use the Q&A function on Zoom so um, I can choose a few after the discussion wraps up. And uh, finally, thank you to the exhibition supporters our signature partner, RBC, and our generous supporters, the Tesari Charitable Foundation. Okay, so um, I'll introduce the speakers before they give their individual amazing presentations. Um, Florina H. Capistrano Baker was formerly museum director of the Ayala Museum in the Philippines, where she is currently a consultant curator. She received the PhD uh, Master of Philosophy and MA from the Department of Art History and Archaeology, Columbia University in the city of New York. She received the AB in Humanities from the University of the Philippines, um, formerly research assistant for Oceania in the Department of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She curated the exhibition Divine Protection, Batak Art of North Sumatra, and authored the book, Art of Island, Southeast Asia, the Fred and Rita Richmond Collection in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, Adam Harris Levine is the curator of Faith and Fortune. Uh, Adam has held various curatorial roles at the AGO and conducted extensive work with the Thompson Collection of European Art prior to becoming assistant curator of European Art in 2020 at the AGO. He is currently finalizing his doctoral dissertation at Columbia University, where he has also taught extensively. Um, his area of specialty in medieval and is in medieval and Renaissance sculpture and decorative arts. And I'm super excited for that dissertation. So um, we're going to start with Nina's presentation, but um, again, I'm really excited to hear the discussion that unfolds afterwards with these two geniuses. So um, I'll be sharing uh, the screen actually. So Nina, you can just um, let me know when to go to the next slide. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to um, Bianca for this wonderful introduction and to Adam for inviting me to this event. And I'm so pleased to be able to share with you the framing narrative of the exhibition, Intertwined Trans-Pacific Transcultural Philippines at Ayala Museum um, in the Philippines, as well as some of the challenges that we experienced organizing a major exhibition during the global pandemic. The framing narrative of the exhibition argues that Filipino identity is intricately entwined with multiple cultures through global phenomena that strength uh, that the um, and that the strength of Philippine culture springs precisely from the flexibility and resilience generated by these multi uh, multiple interwoven strands. Since the exhibition is in the Philippines, our intended audience was primarily Filipino and the larger goal uh, was to instill great awareness and pride in our multicultural heritage. And I'm showing you uh, on the screen a, the mock-up for our forthcoming catalog for the exhibition that's forthcoming in August. Next slide, please. 
So Intertwined was envisioned as a flagship inaugural exhibition to celebrate the anticipated reopening of the Ayala Museum after extensive renovations and expansion that began before the pandemic. The museum was already closed for renovations when I visited Manila in early 2020 to view the construction work in progress, to finalize the objects list and view the objects in private collections and, and uh, cultivate our, our museum supporters. Ayala Senior Director for Arts and Culture, Mariles Gustila, was on top of this major renovation project. Next, please. My visit came after several months of long distance coordination from my New York base with my colleagues in Manila. So it was exciting to be able to work out the details in person. And you'll notice uh, on the, uh, here we, we always have meetings with food and I probably brought the box of chocolates uh, to keep us going. So um, this was in February of 2020 and you'll see our plans for the uh, audience flow and we were working out the details of the groupings of objects. Next slide, please. But by March 2020, just a week after my return to New York, New York City went into lockdown due to the pandemic and Manila went into quarantine. So the delivery of supplies to complete the renovations went into turtle pace. The museum staff couldn't access the building and the work of the engineers and construction workers slowed down according to following the strict protocols imposed. And our curatorial discussion shifted from um, in-person meetings to online Zoom sessions, uh, contributing to our overall Zoom fatigue. Next slide, please. What was most challenging for me personally was imagining the visual coherence of the object groupings based on printed layouts with numbered squares and dots rather than images of the works, which were too many to really incorporate on the printed page uh, to be sent via email back and forth. Um, the exhibition um, came together so spectacularly though. And this was due largely to our talented exhibition designer, Gina Gonzalez, and the uber efficient curatorial staff on the ground, though they also had limited access to the building through most of the process. And most of the work was done virtually even between among staff uh, based in Manila. Next, please. So we installed uh, beginning in 2021, uh, and seeing the objects take their assigned spots was really reassuring and quite exciting. Next, please. The challenges posed by the pandemic were mitigated by the fact that we were able to finalize the objects list and complete the personal visits to institutions and private collections just before the lockdown. The museum's Manila-based curators were with me every step of the way, for though we didn't imagine a global lockdown, we knew that they would have to carry the ball after I returned to the US until my next planned trip to install the exhibition uh, at a later date. So next, please. Next slide, please. Um, I think uh, we skipped some. One more back there. So these visits to colleagues and collectors were always pleasant, always uh, one of the best parts of planning for the exhibition, because if you're familiar with Filipino culture, you'll know that they're always accompanied by meals. Everything we do is accompanied by meals, whether they're sumptuous breakfast, luga, or rice porridge, such as here. Next slide, please or afternoon merienda of pancit, lumpia, sandwiches, which is really a mid-afternoon second lunch after your noonday lunch. Next, please. So, um, of course, there are several uh, implements for, uh, for all these uh, wonderful get-togethers over meals that uh, go back to you know, the colonial period. And here we have a spectacular chocolate service in the exhibition. Um, this was created by a prominent Chinese Filipino silversmith, Tomas Zamora in 1898, attesting to the wealth generated by the Manila Acapulco galleon trade, where silver from the mines of Cusco and Potosi flowed to China via Manila. Next, please. 
With demand for Chinese silk in Western markets fueled this rich flow of Latin American silver to satisfy the nearly insatiable Chinese demand for silver, which underpinned their money supply and uh, transformed the global economy. Note the two paintings in the back by the Filipino expatriate painter and patriot Juan Luna, depicting women from opposite ends of the social spectrum where wearing the famous Mantones de Manila made in China and shipped, uh, uh, transshipped in Manila on the galleons bound for Acapulco, Seville, and beyond. So on the left is an elite lady wearing the manton, uh, taking a walk uh, near the Retiro Park outside Museo del Prado. And on the right, you have a chula or a lady of the night prowling you know, at night. Next, please. A visit to Mexico with colleagues in 2019 to prepare for the exhibition whetted our appetite for objects that we could not include in the exhibition, such as this enormous wooden lectern or fascistol commissioned in 1762 by the Archbishop of Manila as a gift to the Archbishop of Mexico City. So there were really close ties between Manila and um, Mexico. Next, please. Another on our wish list uh, was this mid 17th century wooden trunk whose painted lid is among the earliest images of Manila. So of course we were wanting to uh, bring this back to Manila. And the most exciting thing was our discovery of place names inscribed on the painting, such as you see on the right, the detail uh, inscribing the name Tondo, which is a district in Manila. Uh, we eventually had to cut this from the list and I'm sure Adam can, um, sympathize with you know the, these dilemmas. Next slide, please. At the Hispanic Society uh, in New York, we considered Spanish iterations similar to the Philippine version, such as the figura de vestir, portraying the virgin. And um, but you know, pandemic-related shipping restrictions are another challenge that we're still facing. Uh, so that we're actually extending the exhibition run to 2023 to allow time to process incoming loans and hopefully for overseas colleagues to also come and view the exhibition. Next, please. The, um, okay, so our brilliant designer, Gino Gonzalez, gave life to the curatorial narrative through a dynamic installation of works in the round rather than wall bound. So the color scheme was primarily a dark blue with graphics based on the um, 18th century Murillo Velarde map, uh, which he envisioned against this yellow uh, background. Next, please. When measurements uh, were um, taken though, it seems that they were off when during the actual installation. And this is when I get frantic messages from Manila at say two or 3 p.m. Manila time, which is actually two or 3 a.m. my time. And questions like, do we manufacture a larger yellow panel to achieve the intended pop of bright yellow? We need to decide quickly because you know we have a deadline to catch. And so I felt that, um, for example, here, I felt that too much yellow would detract from distract from the map itself. So we stayed with a, you know, with a status quo. Now this rare map on the right uh, details trading routes between the islands and China with vignettes on the borders depicting inhabitants and natural resources. The floors, as, as you notice on the uh, left slide and um, the display platforms are covered with enlarged images taken from the map, which ties the whole exhibition together. Next, please. The little pop-up vignettes that you see lower left and on the right are also taken from the map, from the side uh, vignettes on the borders. And um, so I opted for the blue pop-ups on the left because I felt the white on the right uh, would compete with the works, uh, with the artworks. Uh, next slide, please. The section on 
conquest and conversion in the Spanish period features 19th century garments and Christian jewelry based on the Catholic rosary, as you see on the case on the left. On the wall behind the jewelry are portraits of elite ladies wearing rich garments and jewelry. And on the right, you see a portrait of Doña Miguela Henson by Simon Flores, who was born in Manila, but painted actively in Pampanga province where his wife was from. The subject Micaela Miguela Henson belonged to a prominent family in a Pampanga town called Mexico, another nod to our Trans-Pacific links. She's depicted in, the, uh, in front of her dresser with her long hair down to her ankles. Uh, next, please. Philip you know, women took great pride in their hair, which uh, they grew long and treated with coconut oil to enhance the, the shiny appearance. She wears a traditional white work blouse or baro made of local pineapple fibers. And you see the actual examples on the right um, from the uh, Intramuros administration in the Philippines. She holds a fan and a book, uh, a device that Flores often uses to indicate that the subject belongs to the educated elite and therefore literate. So what's um, interesting here and noteworthy is that uh, with the rise of uh, affluent uh, families to have painters doing secular work, secular commissions for portraits, in addition to religious uh, commissions. Next, please. The exhibition is in reverse chronological sequence, beginning with a pre-World War II under American colonization and going backward to the Spanish period, thence to prehistory. Next, please. Working backward in time allows one to thoughtfully understand each strand entwined in the fabric of our being Filipino, beginning with the most iconic image of the ideal Filipino promoted by Fernando Amorsolo. This is his 1924 planting rice, which was repeatedly referenced and reinterpreted by other artists through generations. And nearly every household had a painting of a planting rice, even if only a calendar reproduction. I certainly grew up with a planting rice painting in my home. Though not explicitly activist, Amor Solos works encoded nationalist ideals in the face of foreign hegemony. As art historian Rod Paras Perez argues, and I quote, the Americans came to the Philippines initially as friends, which became eventually an occupation in the guise of benevolent assimilation. This gave many Filipinos a deep sense of betrayal. It was a sentiment to be translated by the artists of that generation into a rejection of urban images associated with intruders and an idealization of rural ethos. It was nationalism disguised as a romantic longing for the countryside. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, and we'll have Adam next. Thank you, Bianca. And thank you, Nina. This is, it's such a pleasure to be um, in conversation with you, Nina. I have, you know, admired your work for a really long time. And in fact, in the, um, I think one of the first lockdowns of the pandemic, you gave a Zoom lecture um, at NYU as part of a really wonderful series about art of Latin America. and. And I realized immediately that, um, you know, that I, at years ago, that I, I hoped we could have this conversation when Faith and Fortune opened, because I was very interested in, um, in how this exhibition um, could, could bring to bear um, histories that are not well known um, about um, not only the Spanish colonization of the Philippines, but also trade links across the Pacific through the Acapulco Manila Galleon trade. Um, and, and also I'll just, I'll just mention that um, while working with Bianca uh, throughout the research process, developing this exhibition, um, you know, I was always struck by interesting parallel histories and solidarities between the histories and frankly art histories of Puerto Rico from where my family comes and from the Philippines uh, from where Bianca's family comes. 
Um, just, and it's, it, you know, not only Spanish colonization, but also then recolonization by the United States, um, but also the roles that uh, our two countries have sort of, um, the strategic roles that our two countries have been made to play in empire building through centuries. Um, so Faith and Fortune Art Across the Global Spanish Empire um, opened less than two weeks ago, which is hard to believe. Um, and uh, it's an exhibition that we developed at the Art Gallery of Ontario uh, from the collection of the Hispanic Society Museum and Library, a museum that Nina mentioned in her presentation. Um, and it's interesting that, that um, you know, that Nina's process was so dictated by renovations because um, in fact, Faith and Fortune came to be because the Hispanic Society Museum and Library themselves are undergoing renovations and, and they very graciously offered to lend us some of the greatest works in their collection um, to build this narrative. Um, do you mind advancing the slide, Bianca? Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, so um, Faith and Fortune, we designed to really take an almost forensic examination of the art of the Spanish Empire, uh, beginning with 1492, um, which is sort of a double year uh, from our lens. First, um, the year in which Ferdinand and Isabella, the King and Queen of Spain, um, announce formally that Spain is to be a monolithically Catholic country. They expel Jewish and Muslim people who have inhabited Spain for centuries. Um, and also the year um, that Columbus arrives in the Bahamas, um, believing that he's found a route to the Moluccas. Um, and this begins the European imperial process in the Americas. Um, and then later in 1521, uh, when Magellan arrives um, in the Philippines, um, this process continues across the Pacific. So it starts in 1492, and then the exhibition ends with 1898 the Spanish-American War, um, at which point Spain essentially ceases to become an empire and, um, the, and the Philippines and Puerto Rico are transferred to American colonization. One of the galleries that I love, as, and sorry, um, I should talk about color first because Nina talked about um, her inspirations for color and we also have a very colorful exhibition and um, the, we worked with Marilyn Boom uh, Piper, and a designer at the Art Gallery of Ontario, uh, who did an amazing job. Um, and but I, I will credit Bianca. Um, she um, mentioned the Casa Barragan um, in Mexico City, um, which in, was uh, designed by the architect, modernist architect Luis Barragan, um, and really pointed to his bold use of colors that really um, sent us down this path looking at incredibly vivid and luscious colors. Um, this gallery, which is, um, you know, this, this really kind of juicy orange color um, is dedicated to the Manila galleon trade um, and its history. Um, so that, uh, as Nina mentioned, is a trade route that went from Acapulco in Western Mexico to Manila uh, for um, hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it's the first continuous trade across the Pacific Ocean that was maintained, um, to my knowledge, in human history. Um, and it was a route that um, enabled the movement of luxury goods uh, from Asia by way of Manila um, to Mexico by way of Acapulco, and then by extension across Mexico then to Spain um, and, um, and also to South America. Um, so. If you don't mind advancing the slide, I'll show you some of my favorite objects in, in this room that I think really um, help, to, help us to understand the art um, of the Manila galleon trade. This is an incredible galleon chest. It's, it's, a, it's a strong chest um, that was used by uh, the Spanish merchants who brought ships across the Pacific. Uh, it's dated to around 1700 and it's carved in Nara wood, which is a wood that's very significant to um, Filipino applied arts. Um, hopefully in the Q and A, um, I'll, I'll ask Bianca a couple of questions about Nara Wood because um, she's incredibly knowledgeable about interior architecture in Filipino homes. And we've talked about carved Nara Wood and Capiz shell windows um, as some of the sort of important um, 
materials that are so iconic for um, uh, Filipino applied arts. Um, so this is, I think, just really a wonderful example that kind of roots immediately in, in this kind of thing that allows people, I hope, to allows people to picture um, this cross oceanic, transoceanic trade route. Um, the next object, I think, um, is a really wonderful example of how visual forms move across the Pacific in what I've been calling a silent conversation between artists of Mexico and artists of Asia. Um, so this is a wonderful jar attributed to the Mexican potter of Puebla, Damian Hernandez, uh, from the mid 1600s. And um, it's, it's, I think, a, a, an incredible example of this artistic exchange across the Pacific. You can see that the blue and white um, color palette and the figures that are riding in this chariot um, that I show in the detail um, very closely uh, align with Chinese porcelain that is being exported um, and is highly valued in aristocratic um, centers for the empire, not only Mexico City, um, but also Quito and in Madrid. Um, and so I think in the past, some art historians would say that Damien Hernandez is kind of like just copying whatever he's receiving from Asia. Um, but what I think is a more interesting way of looking at the arts that are made from the galleon trade is that this is a site of invention um, and hybridity and cultures in consistent dialogue through trade over centuries um, that results in the creation of brand new art forms. Um, with strategic appropriation, you know, there is there's an extent certainly of, of copying, um, but it's also using indigenous materials and techniques that are centuries old um, and adapting with forms that are brand new um, through trade. Um, the next object I think is another wonderful example of this. This is a batea, which is like a large uh, ceremonial dish. Um, it takes the form of, sort of a gold panning uh, dish that was used um, um, across the Americas. Um, it's, it, it was made by artists from um, Los Galgos workshop. Um, they're called the Greyhound workshop because they kind of sign their pieces by including little greyhounds in the margins of all of their pieces. That's in Pazcuaro, Mexico. Mexico. Um, and it's um, one kind of unique phenomenon of, of the arts of the Manila galleon trade. Um, or the arts that come out of the Manila Galleon trade is that lacquer um, is an artistic technique that is produced in both Asia and in Mexico and Colombia for many centuries, um, but using different techniques and different materials. When the artists of Mexico and Colombia first um, saw the lacquerware being produced in Korea and Japan that arrived across the Manila Galleon trade, um, they were they adapted some of the imagery that came from Asia using their centuries old materials and techniques. Um, so I find this object to be particularly striking and interesting. Um, the rooster in the center and the lotus blossoms that run around the margin of the batea um, draw upon um, East Asian um, style and imagery. Um, but it's made with a color palette that has been used for many centuries in Mexico. Um, and it has these four portraits of settler Spaniards that run around the inner ring of the bowl. In this way, it sort of contains um, three different cultures um, that are connected via Manila galleon trade. Uh, can you please advance the slide? Um, Nina um, talked about the Montone earlier, and um, we were very lucky to get an absolutely beautiful Montone um, lent from the Hispanic Society um, that sits alongside a reboso from Mexico. Um, they're made in different ways, but um, it's it's you know I I was really excited to kind of create this corner um, that looks at um, trade in textiles um, and thinks about the, you know how women adorn themselves and um, and also how these textiles move uh, between centers of empire um, and how exoticism or foreignness um, I think really carried um, particular meaning 
um, across these different cities. Um, so as Nina mentioned, this manton might have been worn in Manila, but also would have been very, um, you know, very popular in Mexico City or Madrid. Um, the next slide, please. Finally, um, oh yeah, um, this is this. I love this gallery. I, I, I love painted sculpture. Um, we brought together a lot of wonderful painted sculpture from uh, Spain and Mexico and South America. We hoped to, we had hoped to include a Santo Nino um, from the Philippines, but uh, Nino alluded to some of the challenges of creating an exhibition during uh, the pandemic. And um, that was one object that, that didn't ultimately arrive in Toronto. Um, however, this Our Lady of the Apocalypse on the right um, made in Quito, I think is an interesting example. Um, artists in Quito and in South America sometimes made use of ivory faces for their sculptures that were carved in Manila and sent across the Pacific. Um, this sculpture is not actually one of, it, it doesn't have an ivory face, but I, I believe strongly that the artist is looking to um, kind of emulate um, the ivory faces that are present in many sculptures in South America from the Philippines. Um, he uses a very particular um, finish to produce a very smooth and, and um, opaque white surface for the face. Um, and the kind of rouge that's applied to the cheeks is very similar to um, uh, many of the ivory faces. Um, so this is sort of um, a testament to how much of an impact these Philippine ivories have on the, the visual culture of Quito, uh, so much that artists, when they can't get their hands on them, will, will find other ways to create the effect. Um, finally, the, uh, the next slide. Um, the exhibition um, also features a really important set of daguerreotypes um, of the Philippines. These were presented by guest curator, Tani Ann Makabali Pantig, uh, who's a Scarborough-born, Brooklyn-based artist and designer. Um, the daguerreotypes um, from the Hispanic Society are likely the first ever photographs made in the Philippines. Um, they're dated to the first half of the 1840s. Um, so this period is still, um, when the Philippines is, is, is still at this point under Spanish colonization, um, but they are made likely by a French daguerreotype maker named Jules Etier. Um, and they're made under the auspices of American uh, merchants who have already established themselves in the Philippines, um, anticipating that the Spanish empire is crumbling and already sort of looking to move in um, uh, and access um, these markets and to use the Philippines as, as Spain had um, as an important trading post with China. Um, as you can see, I just chose two that I think give a really wonderful view of the diversity of these images. One, um, Rosario Street and Bonando Church in Manila's Chinatown, which is the world's oldest Chinatown. Um, and, then, um, and then a small town, um, a sort of dusty country road leading out of Mahai Hai in the Magdalena province of Laguna. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I really, um, I see some really interesting parallels between our exhibition and the one that Nina has presented at the Ayala. It just seems so um, kind of kismet that both of the, both of these institutions are looking to um, explore some of the same or parallel questions, and the exhibitions are up at the same time. Um, so if you're in um, in Toronto, you can explore some of these questions here, or if you're in Manila, you can explore similar questions there. Um, and I'm very grateful to Zoom technology um, to kind of create this opportunity for us all to put our heads together and to mark this moment of these two exhibitions and, and, and see what we can learn um, by thinking about them side by side. Um, so, so with that, I'd love to move to discussion. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, it's always a huge pleasure to hear uh, you talk about the items in person in the gallery. And um, and I agree, it was just 
it's a great and special moment to have this side by side with Nina and um, um, I'm excited to hopefully visit Manila and Ayala in November and uh, I really appreciated Nina your um, I guess the you, how you described like your personal um, experiences and then just the meals you had in the process of putting it together too <laughs> that was great um, so I I have a few questions that I've sort of put together from our discussions, um, our previous discussions. So um, unless either of you want to start with a few comments just to each other, I can go into the questions. I'll just say one thing well, that I, I wish I had made a slide of um, because Dina had talked about um, Simon Flores and the rise of secular portraiture in the 1800s in the Philippines. Um, we had intended to um, show a Simon Flores, and I think it would have been really wonderful next to Jose Campeche, who is a Puerto Rican painter, um, who similarly makes some of his living making religious images and some of his living making um, portraits of the, the sort of ruling class of um, San Juan in Puerto Rico at this time. Um, so I, I just, I was sort of, one of these, one of the ways that I think we could kind of think about these parallel histories of Manila and San Juan, or more broadly Puerto Rico and the Philippines, is thinking about artists um, like like the two of them who kind of are practicing at clearly a transitional moment in society um, across the empire. Um, Campeche does continue to make, uh, you know, a fair amount of his money decorating churches and making religious images. The AGO actually owns a, a painting of Saint Dominic by Campeche, um, but I think that's true about Simon Flores too. Is that true, Nina? Oh, could you repeat that, please? Did Flores, in addition to making portraits, did he also sort of continue to make money making religious images? Oh um, yes, of course, definitely. Yeah. Yes, yes, they all did. All the. Um, Except for perhaps Juan Luna was doing um, mostly secular because he was living in Madrid. But uh, most of the Manila-based 19th century painters had to earn their living um, doing religious work, religious commissions. Yes. Yeah, what I can do is just um, share the Simon Flores painting that um, Nina did have in her presentation, mm -hmm. just so mm -hmm. people know um, who we're talking about. I love this painting. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, and I think it's interesting, you know, um, just looking at the sort of Rococo style vanity that the, um, that Miguel and Henson is leaning on. Um, you know, what, what, and maybe this is a question for Bianca because um, the Simon Flores painting that we were, we had looked to borrow um, also had sort of like an interesting kind of hybrid interior, um, one that felt like there were cupcake shell windows, but then there were sort of European Rococo style furniture. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know, that's just sort of... Um... Well, most of Simon Flores's works did incorporate um, uh, interior scenes that indicate the wealth of the patrons. So you'd see it's it's uh, almost like he's setting them in a uh, a tableau, um, you know, a stage setting to display, um, to provide clues to their identity. Uh, the painting that you wanted to borrow from the Kiasan family uh, certainly has that with the, you know, the lavish drapes and um, images of the, um, the imported or, imported and locally carved furniture, the uh, elaborate um, garments, uh, luxurious garments that are very expensive to produce, all hand woven of piña fibers and hand embroidered. Their uh, skirts would be such as here from imported silks, um, whereas the, the barro or the top would be, you know, this uh, locally, locally manufactured, hand manufactured, um, uh, bottle or uh, top uh, garments. And some of these other paintings that we've exhibited in the past would always contain clues to the level of education, to the, you know, to the religious um, 
uh, commitment of certain sitters. You could have a stern looking elite. And they're mostly from Pampanga province because that's where he was practicing. And you'd have this very stern looking uh, older lady uh, seated in front of a, an ivory carving. So that indicates her, you know, her religious uh, affiliation and uh, the way he, that, that he portrays these uh, sculptures within the painting is actually quite remarkable as well. And so he's one of the practitioners of what uh, is called the miniaturismo. A technique where all the details are uh, carefully worked up in this trompe l'oeil uh, manner, and she's she's holding a uh, like like Miguel here. She's holding a book, uh, and she's holding a rosary. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of uh, the, the sitter as a person. So his his works are. Uh, defined or characterized by those uh, the attention to the detail and the 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 clues encoded in the painting. But yeah, I wanted the Flores, uh, sorry the Flores painting um, we had wanted also showed an entire family and that's also something that really attracted us because there was just so much going on. Yes, um, yes, yeah. we had shown that at Ayala Museum in two thousand and four. Um, Oh no, we showed the other one because they were brothers. So there's another Kiazan family portrait with um, only four members of the family, two children, and um, and and it's a very similar style and sometimes confusing. But the the Kiazan brothers were quite prominent in Pampanga, and so the, the three brothers all had uh, commissioned Simon Flores, uh, you know, these uh, wonderful portraits. Um, I also wanted to um, say, uh, to react to Adam, if I may, uh, to his wonderful presentation. And um, this makes me really want to uh, travel to see the exhibition. And I wish that we could have like a group traveling from one exhibition in Toronto to uh, the other one in Manila, because as you say, there are so many parallels and it seems like Kismet, we have overlaps, although they're not exactly the same. Um, the Faith and Fortune timeline overlaps with the intertwined timeline, although it, you know, it begins with 1492 and ends in 1898, whereas intertwined begins in the 1950s during the American colonial period after the Spanish uh, period, because that was uh, the period that was more immediately familiar. It's, it was in the recent past that's still remembered by many Filipinos. And of course, we're addressing different audiences. Uh, so the intertwined exhibition uh, was primarily addressing a Filipino audience. And so to, um, to hook them into this narrative, uh, the, the, the thinking was that, um, what is Filipino identity? That's actually the, the question. What is Filipino identity? Uh, how do we get here? And so we had to start from something very familiar. And so our time frame goes back from the American colonial period to um, actually 1950s is uh, shortly after we had independence in 1946, but we're still, you know, um, very much influenced by the American period. Um, and um, then we go back to the Spanish period, which is sort of familiar to um, most Filipinos as the Spanish heritage. And then we stretch it even uh, further back in time to the pre-colonial period, which is not very familiar with uh, uh, among many Filipinos. So we have a different trajectory, longer perhaps, and uh, we did uh, try, we did attempt to put Filipino culture in a global context, but it was always necessarily Manila centric, whereas Faith and Fortune uh, uh, kind of provides the missing parts of intertwine. It's like two exhibitions with uh, different parts of the puzzle that if you kind of merge them together, you'd get the larger picture. And that's why it was so exciting to listen to Adam and to see uh, what um, he was trying to accomplish with this exhibition. Well, I should celebrate you because 
you did also just finish a project with the Getty Research Institute and the mm. KHI and the Max Planck that did really look extremely globally at, mm -hmm. at, at the sort of broad puzzle um, that I think we were looking to accomplish too. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like your exhibition is, is really well rooted in, in at the IAL, it, 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 you know, it, it's um, specifically for a Filipino audience. I think, you know, we mm -hmm. in Toronto, we're also um, very lucky to have, you know, a thriving and huge Filipino diaspora community um, that's been in Canada for, for many, many years. Um, and so we're very excited not only to have the, to have the daguerreotypes, but more broadly, the sort of um, this focus on the role of the Philippines in the Spanish empire, um, which I think is, has only really, despite the fact that it, it was many, many hundreds of years, it, it does not really, um, it has not been studied in the same way, say as, as Mexico or Puerto Rico or, or Chile. Um, and I've never quite understood why perhaps um, American imperialism in the Philippines sort of dominates the conversation because it is most recent and it's so fresh in, and it's so tangible. Um, but but yeah, do you have a sense of why this is only sort of I have directed a, it at this yes. moment? That's a very good question. And I have a, a theory about that because the narrative has always been controlled by, you know, the, the American, um, we call it the American miseducation. And um, looking back to the American colonial period, by the time the Americans came in 1898, uh, the majority of the population, the mainstream population was devoutly Catholic, highly educated. We had a university that we like to say is older than Harvard. Um, and we had, uh, we had the intelligentsia who were studying abroad, who were exposed to um, the centers of Paris, and, and uh, Spain and Madrid. These were actually the leaders of the revolution against Spain. And so it was, uh, it, we had printing presses, you know, it was a very cosmopolitan um, uh, society with ties around the globe. We were interacting with Mexico and beyond. Um, so um, when the Americans took control of uh, the country, through the Treaty of Paris ending the Spanish-American War in Cuba. Uh, so we were sold off. We had won, actually won our independence from Spain during the independence move, the, the war for independence. And we had actually declared our independence, but of course, and Americans had come as uh, saviors to help us against the fight against Spain. But what actually happened was, instead of recognizing our independence, we were placed under colonial American colonial rule. And there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of objections uh, to this uh, in the US, uh, spearheaded by Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, objecting to this uh, American experiment in imperialism, which actually um, uh, went against uh, all the ideals of the newly established nation. But in order to justify the colonization of the Philippines to the American public, what was presented overseas were not the mainstream population, but rather the maybe 2% of the non-converted uh, uh, cultural groups who were up in the uh, Cordillera Mountains that the Spaniards had never been able to completely subjugate. Also the Islamic populations because you know, they were much more organized and they were able to um, uh, fend off the, the, the Spaniards. But the main, main population had a, a quite a, you know, a Hispanic uh, sort of very close to the Mexican culture and um, was very cosmopolitan. This is what was erased. This mainstream culture is what was erased. And I think that's why um, there were like two schools of thought uh, that prevented people from actually, or scholars to, from actually looking at investigating um, 
mainstream mainstream Philippine culture. One was, oh, it's too Western. It's too similar to us. It's not exotic enough. So, you know, forget that. They're just copies of, you know, European. Their works are copies of European traditions. Uh, their food is not exotic enough. It's not Japanese or Chinese. It's, you know, a blend. It's It tastes like Cuban food or Mexican food. So it's, it's not interesting enough. On the other hand, you have another school of thought that thinks, oh, well, that doesn't really belong in mainstream conversation because, you know, it, it belongs in the so-called primitive art uh, category because um, the, there's this misconception that Philippine art is about uh, the village traditions, um, the ancestor figures uh, that uh, kind of have affinities with Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, the, you know, the indigenous groups of Indonesia um, and some indigenous groups in non-Islamic Malaysia, et cetera. So it's kind of put in that box. Um, and I think now there's this growing realization that, wait a minute, you know, we've been missing this other link. Um, and so I'm so glad that there's now this kind of uh, global interest now uh, in exploring and revisiting and rediscovering these close links between Manila and Latin America, which I think um, hasn't been addressed before. Uh, we were educated to think that uh, our ties were directly with Spain, which is not really accurate. And so there's, you know, there, it, it's, there, it's very exciting for the field of Philippine and Latin American studies at this point. You know, you touched on something real that I that I I want to respond to because it's it's so important to me. It's in the exhibition. It's a big part of the exhibition, and it's a part that I'm really proud that that we've explored, which is um, how throughout the history of colonization and empire building, um, colonizing forces repeatedly use um, anti-indigenous tropes um, as justification for colonization. Um, so starting in the 1490s, um, we already start to see Spanish, the Spaniards kind of producing sort of um, um, these, these claims that indigenous people in the Americas and in the, the Caribbean um, like need to be um, governed, that they are, you know, um, living sort of, they are unquote un uncivilized and uh -huh. need to be governed. Um, and it's striking, it's so striking to hear that in as late as the 1890s, the Americans recycled this playbook by um, uh, sort of um, choosing very particular aspects of life in the Philippines and, and, and trying to kind of trot out again this, this justification for colonization. And that is something that we explored really closely in the exhibition, how um, these mythologies are formulated and how they are kind of almost lazily regurgitated and reused, recycled um, throughout the various histories of colonization that we look at. Um, so it's really striking to that, you know, you bring up the American example and, ha and how it's used again in as late as 1898. Um, mm -hmm. And beyond. Beyond yeah. 1898, it were, we had a American anthropologists coming to the Philippines, you know, from uh, 1898, 19, 1904, 1911, uh, still perpetrating this myth that Filipinos are primitive. Uh, it's, it's surprising sometimes even in the 21st century, 20th, 21st century, you have uh, museum curators who shall be unnamed. <laughs> who claim that, you know, who just casually say, oh, Filipinos were not literate, all oh, Filipinos were naked, uh, because all they have to work with are these archival photographs that were taken by the Americans, uh, you know, sort of like people still país, but but without the, you know, without the clothing, and they would sensationalize the headhunters. Uh, and those are the images that you see, the 1904 uh, St. Louis Exposition, mm -hmm. where you have uh, whole communities of uh, people from the Cordilleras uh, exposed like a human zoo, some of them actually dying because it was cold and they were forced to wear, you know, their G strings and, you know, and, and, you know, appear as primitive. And even, even the Spanish 
what well, did this in 1877, they had an exposition Las Islas Filipinas at the Crystal Palace outside the Prado in Madrid. And they also exhibited you know, the, the minorities are the cultural minorities uh, and, you know, disregarding the fact that the ma main population was actually highly educated and, and civilized. And our national hero, uh, Jose Rizal, who was an, uh, for some time an expatriate with that painter Juan Luna, whose paintings I showed you earlier, uh, was, you know, really objecting to this display of his countrymen uh, as a, a savages, like in a human zoo. So it has, you know, wide ranging repercussions that I think even today, uh, some um, well-meaning academics who are teaching uh, or who are required to teach intro to art history classes who are not uh, Philippine specialists, go back to this uh, 1904 uh, exposition as an introduction to Philippine culture. And so, you know, um, my question is how, how many generations of scholars and, um, and, and academics do we have to go through uh, to finally dispel this uh, total misrepresentation of the culture where the minority is always presented as the majority culture? Um, so there. And certainly in the Canadian, you know, one of the questions that we asked throughout the making of Faith and Fortune was in the Canadian context, what, how, how do we learn from, from this global history, which doesn't actually involve Canada? How does it, how does it, what does it bring to bear on contemporary life in Canada? And I do think that, um, that uh, you know, as a, as a nation that is, continues to sort of move through the reconciliation process, um, uh, that these mythologies around indigeneity are like firmly baked into um, settlers ideas about indigenous people. Um, and it's not just specific to Spain, um, to the Spanish empire, but I do think that the Spanish empire is the foundational architecture for some of these mythologies. Um, and that it has major ramifications for many different colonial and, and post-colonial contexts. So uh, I think we'll move uh, to Q&A. There's so much really to discuss between the two exhibitions. And I also appreciated, I guess, um, talking about how they were organized in terms of to a Filipino audience and then to the audience here in Toronto, but also something Adam and I had mentioned um, earlier was how uh, the exhibition in at the Ayala kind of goes from reverse chronological order, maybe because it is hard to find that first origin point, as you say, for becoming a Filipino and even what is that? Um, whereas we went in, in pretty uh, like classical uh, chronological order. So that was something interesting that, um, that uh, we wanted to mention, but uh, also I think we should move to the Q&A. Um, so we have a couple and um, I think I'll, I'll quickly start with Geraldine's question because um, she just wanted to, um, she's just referring to the part about um, me expanding on the wooden chest. So I, uh, I'll put that back on, on the screen, but. Um, um, well, yeah, I hope we can one day show them side by side um, with Nina's, with the chest that Nina wanted to bring to, to the Ayala that. from, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're both, they would make such an interesting conversation. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, in terms of the interior architecture, uh, that was one of the ways that Adam and I really first connected was um, my in, I guess, was more in, in architecture. And so when I looked at this wooden chest, I thought immediately of uh, one of my aunts, my tita's houses in Makati. And mm -hmm. she sort of has these like wooden panels uh, next to the doorway that have like similar curves and and I also would, but um, but yeah, I was I think thinking about material in, in this like context of architecture was interesting for me because you could um, really I guess like hang on to things like uh, the yakal wood of a facade and and the um, the capiz shells again 
and also um, the rattan that's that's really prevalent in Southeast Asia. So that was sort of, um, I think, what Geraldine asked. And then Emma Beth um, says, can you talk about religious objects on display? How is their religiosity transformed when in different context, i.e. secular museum context as art objects? Or was the intention to keep their religious religiosity as part of the narrative of the exhibition? Nina, was that, wanna... um, yes, addressed to me. I think I we think both, both have the same question. Do you want to go first in yeah. the Ayala context? I can go first. I can go first, yes, because we have a lot of these religious images. Uh, I'm sad that I didn't really have enough time to show all of the images um, uh, that we have on exhibition, but we have uh, several ivory uh, sculptures of the Virgin Mary, uh, Mater de la Rosa, uh, Saint Michael the Archangel, um, the saints, uh, San Vicente Ferrer, uh, John the Baptist, uh, and so on. Uh, a lot of crucifixion image images and they actually serve a double purpose to you know to to address that question I know that uh, there are uh, questions regarding the the um, you know uh, uh, dispelling the religious or or um, the, the ethics of displaying religious sculptures, religious works, whether they're Hindu Buddhist or Catholic or Islamic, um, uh, taking them out of their religious context and placing them in an artificial secular context. But I think speaking for the religious images that we have, the Catholic images that we have at Ayala Museum, and I think um, this holds for other um, exhibitions uh, of these objects in the Philippines as well, we're, we're still a very, very devout Catholic country. And so um, whether these images are uh, on exhibit or whether they're being used in a church or in a private home, they never lose their sanctity. Uh, they're never disrespected. They're always considered a religious image. And so there's not like a big transition from, you know, a, a secular context in a museum environment uh, versus uh, the same image could be used in a home altar. Um, so it could, you could have it in your home altar, you can dress it uh, during special occasions, um, and you can have the same image brought to the museum for exhibition, uh, or you can have the same image that's uh, in a church uh, or you know the huge crucifix from the University of the uh, uh, University of Santo Tomas could be at the university uh, and in the museum. It doesn't lose its um, you know its its uh, spiritual implications uh, as far as the museum going public is concerned. Yeah, I'll just say I'm you know I I tend to, um, at the AGO I'm I'm curator of art from you know, roughly the year 1000 to 1700. And, and I do, um, most of that is religious imagery and um, it's not uncommon for me while I'm, I'm giving tours, um, you know, every once in a while I'll see someone cross themselves while they're looking at an image. Um, I think it's really exciting when um, art can um, sort of transcend time. It's clear that, um, you know, there's an idea, I think that when you take an image and put it in a museum that it becomes inert or it somehow becomes socially dead and just becomes an object of history. But it's very clear for many people, especially devout Catholics who are come to see the exhibition that that's, that, you know, there's no nothing, there's no transmutation as soon as the art object crosses the threshold into the museum. Um, and, and I think, one of the things that you know was so important to the exhibition is that this the history that we're exploring has very tangible connections to the present mm -hmm. um and that to me is evident you know that this that's a great a great piece of evidence for that is how um some of the religious images in the exhibition continue to draw devotion from latin american and filipino visitors um i i I feel bad. I'm gonna. Um, I'm doing a bad job of being a, a panelist and not a moderator. But I want to go back to something that Bianca was just saying about materials. You were talking about nara wood and kapi shells, and um, and 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 we talked about pina fabric um, several times. Um, you know the wonderful embroidered Filipino 
garments. And um, one thing that is so interesting to me about piña is it's so iconically Filipino, but the pineapple comes to um, the Philippines from Latin America via the Manila galleon trade. Mm -hmm. um, so in some ways, I, what, what do you think, Nina? Uh, it, the, the piña fabric as like intrinsically Filipino is sort of yes. great evidence for the thesis of your exhibition that the very essence of Filipino-ness can actually be its connection to Latin America um, through this history. Yes, I think there's a very good argument for that, although I would modify that and say that uh, the, I guess the intrinsicness of the, the mainstream lowland Filipino Christian culture is uh, the two-way exchange between um, you know, the Philippines and Latin America because uh, the piña, fiber, for example, the piña, the pineapple itself uh, did uh, come from Latin America. And um, of course, through the years, we thought it was indigenous to us. Uh, it's rude awakening to find out that it's, it wasn't. And we transformed it into something distinctly Filipino. Um, although I must add that um, uh, there is a misconception that piña fibers and piña textiles only are found in the Philippines. Uh, there's a, a textile scholar, uh, Sandra Castro, who has uh, who argues that uh, there are piña fibers produced in China and India as well, but not uh, you know not as closely associated with their nationality um, as it's become in the Philippines where it's become the national dress, probably not as widespread a practice. And, you know, I don't know if it even survives to this day, but with the intertwined worlds that we lived in and still live in, uh, it's not surprising that you would have these other uh, iterations and instantiations of, uh, you know, these um, um, related uh, phenomena related textile uh, practices. Um, the piñas that we have are closely informed by embroideries from Belgium and Switzerland. And uh, we also have Manila, uh, Manila motifs that are in Switzerland that are named after Manila. So there's always this intertwined uh, uh, connections. And uh, in Mexico, uh, the I would say the mango, which is now such a big part of Mexican economy, is actually from Manila. Uh, so, and but it's so closely related to Mexico. So I might even go as far as to argue that well, Mexican culture is really based on also the formation of uh, the the, the uh, Christianized Mexican culture. Really, uh, also goes back to the trade with the Philippines because even the you know the well the rebosa is from um, the Indonesian slendang, the mantones de Manila, the shawls are also part of their culture as they are part of Seville uh, and Spanish culture, and that's all coming from Asia, uh, from China through Manila. So it's never a one way uh, uh, directional uh, exchange, but it's always a two way directional exchange. And I think one of the interesting things to aspects of this exchange to study uh, all includes, you know, what the influences are and what the conceptually, uh, visually, in terms of um, art forms, uh, in terms of aesthetics, flora, fauna, and all of these, to study also the impact of that galleon trade of Asia, uh, the impact of Asia on Latin America, which I think also has not really been thoroughly examined. I mean, you have scholars like, for example, Govan Bailey has, you know, uh, written about uh, uh, Asian influences in, um, in Latin America. Um, there are scholars who, like Mea Priyadarshini, my co-editor, has uh, written about uh, the Chinese blue and whites, uh, in fact, the uh, Talavera blue and whites in Puebla. Um, but I, but these are, you know, um, I guess these sort of skim the surface and perhaps we need something deeper where, uh, because I think a big complaint or a big complaint of many Filipinos is that, um, why is it that Filipinos are always made to feel as though they're 
they have nothing original, that everything came from Spain and everything came from Mexico. And we have to remind them that, well, that's coming from the Western perspective because that's what they're seeing. But if you uh, try to uh, look at the reverse uh, phenomenon and uh, look at this objectively with really the goal of finding, uh, uh, of being more sensitive to and recognizing the uh, conceptual, the, the religious, um, and the, the material uh, uh, changes and transformations uh, that occurred in Latin America because of the galleon trade. For example, you have the Parian uh, in Mexico, which is, you know, from modeled after, or not modeled, but at least named after the Parian in Manila. Uh, so I think that would be a, a really uh, interesting uh, conversation that uh, a lot of people would be interested in. Um. Offline, let's find some funding and let's spend 10 years working on this. Because That's great, I'm in. It's a conversation that absolutely needs to keep continuing exactly. and developing. Exactly. Oops. Uh, I think this has been super inspiring and it's uh, it's 10 past five in, in Toronto. So I think um, we'll wrap up this amazing set of presentations soon. And I'm sure Adam and Nina can make themselves available if there are any other questions that remain. But um, I hope we all have a great evening kind of absorbing all these inspiring um, thoughts and provocations. But thank you to everyone who's uh, attended. And thank you, Adam and Nina, so much for um, your work on this. Thank you so much, Bianca. Thanks, thank everyone. you, Bianca. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great night.